Mr. Derek Vienhoff. He's better known as Deke. Drinking liquor with DJ Deke, we out laughing. Yo, Deke. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Uh, this is Deke coming in live. Not really live, pre-recorded, but uh, I'm here joined today by Terry McDermott, uh, journalist and author of uh, Perfect Soldiers uh, and The Hunt for KSM, among some other books. And um, this is uh, The Perfect Soldiers uh, came out in, I think, 05, was it? And this is... Um, one of the, or rather, you describe it as the only uh, book actually written on the hijackers, specifically uh, 9-11. Which right. I find amazing, right? Yeah. There's only one book, one of the worst, worst crimes in world history. Yeah, and so the reason why there's only one book, um, and hopefully you can tell us all about this, is that at the time you had the funding and sort of the um, logistics to actually go uh, in the field uh, to a few different continents and was it about 20 countries to knock yeah. on doors and yeah. get the full story. So um, would you like to tell us about how that all came about or maybe well, maybe even back up a little bit about how you got into journalism and how you came to, to radical Islam as a topic? Oh uh, man, I didn't come to it. It came to me. No, yeah, right, right. Uh, I've been a journalist uh, since, yeah, man, uh, since my mid twenties. Uh, I, I had a few breaks in there. I, I Worked as a carpenter for a couple of years. I worked in politics for a couple of years. Uh, and I, I kept getting fired from newspapers. So it was, uh, or quitting in anger. You know. uh, I was not a good employee in the early years. I, I, I couldn't understand why everybody didn't think I was as great as I thought I was. Uh, but I eventually settled into it. And beginning in about the late 80s, I, I basically did long term, long form project reporting from then on. Uh, first in, in, in Seattle, at the Seattle Times, and then at the LA Times. Uh, I came here to Los Angeles, and that's where I am now is Los Angeles. I came here in 98 and haven't left. Um, the, I, I was doing, as I said, project longer term stuff, but I knew, had no interest or knowledge of radical Islam or terrorism. In fact, the guy who sat uh, across from me and in the office was our, was a terrorism reporter and everybody kept giving him a hard time. He couldn't get his paper, his stories in the newspaper, uh, you know, because nobody cared um, until 9-11. And um, I mean, that day I was taking my middle daughter to her middle school carpool um, and I heard it on the radio that something had happened. And when I dropped her off, I went home and packed a bag and went to the office and Worked out of the LA Times office for a couple of year, a couple of weeks after that, and then was told to go do the story on the hijackers. And was told uh, this this would never happen today. But I was told to go wherever I needed to go, stay as long as I needed to stay. You know, right. so it, eight years later, I was done with it. <laughs> uh, it so it was uh, without that support. Obviously, I, mean, I, I never added up how much I spent. But it had to be easily half a million dollars, uh, just on hotels, food, translators, security, cars, right, right. bribes. You know, um, it's it's expensive, and I, a newspaper is really kind of the only vehicle that would ever do that. I mean, even magazines, what we think of as in-depth magazine pieces, aren't funded like that. I mean, most of them are kind of reasonably. You know, like ten thousand dollars or something like that, uh, and, and expenses. So, the paper wanted the story, and and they gave it to me, and and, and I went and knocked on doors. I mean, that's basically all I did. I, I you couldn't, you know, one way I've described it is that it's, it's a, a typical crime story. You know, every journalist has written a profile of a murderer at some point in his or her career, and this is the same thing. And so there's a template for it. It's not, it's not uh, you know, some erotic, uh, exotic uh, sort of story. It's just you have to find people who knew the people, right? Yeah. So yeah. usually it's people they went to school with, family, friends, people they worked with. And it always amazed me that in the wake of some horrible event that 
when you started finding people about like with a murder or some horrible thing, some catastrophe, people will talk to you. You walk in off the street. They don't know you from Adam. And five minutes later, they're telling you their deepest secrets. I've had this happen several times where you're sitting there with a husband and wife and and he's telling you the stuff that he's never talked about, obviously, and she's never heard it before. You know, and, and, and they're both crying and I'm just some guy who walked in. Yeah. Uh, I used to think that was me, you know, that I had some great <laughs> skill at this, but it's not. It's just I just I was just the one who was a problem at the time. So that's what you have to do. You have to find the people. The problem with this story was you couldn't friends, family, coworkers, fellow students. Yeah, I couldn't find them. You couldn't identify them. Um, the Arab naming conventions make it difficult. Uh, I mean, one of the uh, Muhammad Adas college classmates said that that you know that they were, when he first looked at, at where he was assigned for classes, there were like six pages of Muhammad's. You know, there's, yeah, yeah. so I mean, and as I described in the book, Muhammad Ada was never known as Muhammad Ada anywhere he ever lived. He was known as Muhammad El Amir. Uh, Ada is the last of six names on his passport, but the family never used that name. So, you know, that sort of thing compounded by 19 people, it, it's just made it difficult. So you can't, you can't figure out who the people are. Once you figure out who they are, you can't find them. I mean, it's not like you had, uh, you know, phone book for Cairo. Uh, no such thing exists uh, or anywhere else. I mean, in all these other countries in the Emirates, um, so, so you, you, once you identify them, the problem becomes finding them. Once you find them, the problem becomes getting them to talk to you, which they wouldn't do. And once they, once you persuade them to talk to you, they lie. So it, it's a, it's a formidable undertaking, and it's a, it's a very low yield business. I mean, you, you don't get much. There are lots of weeks in the reporting of, of this that I went backwards. I mean, I lost information that that, that was thought to be true that proved not to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's just, it, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm probably one of the most stubborn. And I, I just, uh, I just would refuse to to stop. And eventually, what happens is you, you there's a, you, there's, there's a crack. Um, is one of the, the greatest Canadians ever ever said. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Uh, so there, you get a crack, and you open it up, and then you open it up, and then eventually the stories come. And once you have groundings in fact, uh, and the fact that you just won't go away, people eventually, will, many of them, will talk to you. Uh, that's now, what happened. Can you help me understand? Um, so would intelligence agencies have gathered anything from the work that you did? Like- I had- yeah, I had lots of meetings with intelligence people in lots of different countries, and more often than not, they were giving I was giving them more than they were giving me. They, they, mm-hmm. they, in fact, they don't care about this kind of stuff, right? They don't care who Muhammad Atta was, right? They care what he did, and they care to be able to prove a crime or to prevent future ones. Right. But right. The, but the idea of of, of them um, getting a, constructing a detailed biography of these people it just is foreign to them. Uh, they just don't do that. Uh, whereas to me, that, that's the most vital, most important stuff you can possibly know. How can you know who's going to do this stuff unless you understand the people who've done it? Right? I, and the, the misconceptions about terrorism, I mean, they just never go away. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I read the same mistakes that were being made in 2001 over and over again. Right. Um, these guys, you know, this. I spent literally a year trying to figure out who recruited these guys, a- until I finally just realized, hey, no, nobody. They're volunteers, and, and that's true of almost all of contemporary terrorists. They, they show up. The Hamburg guys. The book focuses on the three pilots from Hamburg, Germany, and and one of their compatriots, Ramzi Bensheva. Yeah, this is where they went to school in Hamburg. Is that? Right, right. They went to yeah. post post high school. Uh, right. Ada already had a college degree. He was in graduate school. Um, Marwan El Shehi was studying marine, or supposed to be studying marine engineering. He never really went to class much. Uh, Ziad Jarrah was was supposed to be studying aeronautical engineering. 
Um, but once they fell into this sort of radical Islam, they didn't do a lot of schoolwork. Uh, anyhow, I kind of lost my thread there. So, uh, yeah, the, in the Hamburg cell. Right. Uh, well, so the book concentrates on them because they were, well, first of all, three out of the four pilots. The, and most of the hijackers, as we know, were Saudis. And Saudi Arabia is a really hard place to report. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of places that are hard places to report, but this is ridiculous. You can't, you don't have much freedom of movement. You can't do interviews. Uh, I mean, you can, but it's, it, it, you, know, you get, you get in trouble for it. Uh, I did an amount of reporting there, but it's just a really hard place. And plus, I was more interested in the, in the, in the guys who flew the planes. Uh, and, you know, they, they showed up in Afghanistan. You know, the idea that they, one of the early ideas was that Mohammed Otto was, was one of the designers of the plot, that, that he was, uh, they sat in this little apartment at Mary Strasse 54 in Hamburg, and, you know, because they hated Americans or tall buildings or something, they, they came up with this plan. That's complete and utter bullshit. I mean, they never came up with anything. They, most of the time they were in Hamburg, they were talking about going to fight Chechnya. And in fact, right, right. But when they went, these guys, I mean, legitimately thought they were doing God's work. I mean, they saw themselves as soldiers of God. Uh, and they, they spent a couple of years asking one another and themselves, what, what, what ought we do? What's, what's, what's incumbent upon us as believers to do? And they, and they decided that they should go fight. Uh, they should go fight on behalf of Islam. And, but they didn't know where. And as I said, they eventually settled on Chechnya. And then they ran into a friend on, in Hamburg who told him, that's idiotic. You can't just go to Chechnya. You'll get shot by both sides. You have to go get trained, and then people will figure out how to get you in there. And so they went to Afghanistan, uh, hoping to get trained to go fight the Russians in Chechnya. And they showed up literally within a week of when bin Laden had okayed Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's plan to use the airplanes as missiles. They, now, can, they just happened to show up. Can you help us understand, and um, maybe it's a little ignorant of a question, but the difference between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is the small cell with uh, that bin Laden and KSM uh were part of, but Taliban is a larger political, more political uh, organization that deals with Pakistan. Well, the ta 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 Taliban, the Talib is a student, is a is a Urdu word for student, mm -hmm. uh, and they were originally students in the Pakistani madrasas, uh, almost all of which was funded by the Saudis. So those are these so, Islamic schools, right? Islamic yeah. schools scattered all over Pakistan, um, mm -hmm. and they teach a pretty. Um, a desert version of, of Islam. It's not a contemporary version whatsoever. It's not. It, it could have been the same thing taught in the 16th century in the in the middle of the Great Arabian Desert. Um, so it's a, it's a very it's very out of step with the world. And the people who come out of that are out of step with the world. And these guys who then went, many of them went to Afghanistan, and were appalled by the state of of the culture there and decided that they should reform it. And they became the biggest political movement in Pakistan, or I'm sorry, in Afghanistan, and eventually took over the government. And they, and they were the government in place uh, at 9-11. And they had made a sort of informal pact with bin Laden that they wouldn't screw with him. He could do whatever he wanted there. He could run his own training camps. Uh, uh, they, weren't, they weren't about that. They didn't want to get into that, into, uh, a fight with him or anybody else. They already had enough to do, just reforming according to their uh, desires, uh, Afghanistan. So Al-Qaeda was probably no more than a thousand people worldwide. I mean, if you, if you, you wouldn't, you'd probably be young, but after 9-11, you'd see these maps that showed Al-Qaeda everywhere. Uh, and there, it really wasn't. I, I always, always it, it intrigued me or puzzled me for a long time that almost every significant character in the book or anywhere that you met in, in, in Al-Qaeda, the lowest foot soldier, had all met Bin Laden. And right. I thought, how could that possibly be? Well, there aren't very many of them. <laughs> and, and in fact, you know, it's the, it's the smallness of their size that made them so effective. That we're, all of our, the Western defenses were constructed to fight state actors. 
you know, hostile states with big armies. And Not small armies. individuals and little cells. Yeah. and Yeah, right. Yeah, it's just they were invisible in, in a lot of ways. I mean, there was awareness of bin Laden because of the, the issue of these two declarations of war against the United States. Uh, and in fact, they had bombed the embassies, two embassies in Africa. Can you to- can you actually expand on that? What was what was the timeline again of Bin Laden's initial declarations? Ninety six, and it was the first fatwa, and ninety eight was the Al Qaeda declaration of war against the United States. Okay, yeah. Um, the main his main uh, problem with the United States uh, had to do with Al Qaeda or Afghanistan or anything else. It had to do with the Saudi, the royal Saudi family's reliance upon the United States. And he thought that the, the Saudi royal family was corrupt, which, of course, it is. Uh, and he wanted to purify Saudi Arabia. And he saw the United States as an obstacle to that. He had uh, gone to them and they had sort of turned him away for protection. They kind of laughed, they laughed at him. Yeah. yeah. He, said he would bring – first, if bin Laden went to Afghanistan to, uh, to during the, the Soviet war, the war against the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had a small – and he funded a small group of fighters – and train them. Uh, I mean, they were in, in, completely inconsequential in terms of the course of that war. They they, they didn't fight much. Uh, there's, there's some question whether he fought at all. Uh, and whatever they did, they did toward the end of it. It, did, it had nothing to do with the outcome. But they kind of created the, 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 this image of the, the, the Arab fighters, the Mujahideen, uh, fighting the great the Soviet army. Uh, to a standstill, it was so, so romantic that it, that it caught hold. It helped by a lot by like there were several American politicians who went and you know and put on the hats and carried the guns and uh, you know it's like going on vacation. In fact, kids. I mean, I, I talked to, to people who were when they were 14, 15, 16 years old would go to Afghanistan to the camps on summer vacation. It was like. You know, uh, back in the 50s, people would go to Cuba to pick sugar, to harvest sugar cane with Fidel. I mean, it was a sort of acting out this romantic notion of the, of the, the yeah, underdog yeah. revolutionaries. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were a lot of people cycled through the camps who were never part of Al-Qaeda. Uh, uh-huh. So there was a small core group of a couple thousand, but maybe. Uh, and they were, there were some scattered around different places, but primarily in the Middle East and in Afghanistan. And so um, it, it gave uh, bin Laden a base from which to operate, uh, where he was protected by the terrain. He's hard to find. Uh, it's a very inhospitable uh, physical location. Was his, was, sorry, was his funding from his family's uh, yeah, money? It was, or? His, it was an inheritance, yeah. Uh, okay. His, his father, uh, his family were, were actually not even Saudis. They they emigrated to Saudi Arabia from Yemen, uh, out in the middle of Yemen, out, out in the middle of nowhere, the Hajjimaut, which is a historically interesting place, but there's not much going on there. Um, and his father became a, a, a building co- a contractor uh, and built the lots of roads and airports. He became one of the, the favorite contractors of the Saudi royal family and so made a fortune building things, in, mainly in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and the money passed down to his, I can't remember now. So got, did somebody die? Is that why he got the money? Yeah, the father died. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and there were like 30 kids. Yeah. And they each got some share. Uh, and and Osama got his share of you know, millions of dollars, but not, not, a, not like what we think of as a huge fortune today because it's, these tech guys all have billions of dollars. It's nothing like that, but it was substantial, and it was enough to, to fund some sorts of things. And uh, needed, yeah, yeah. I mean, the one thing to remember about about terrorism is that it's cheap. Yeah, you, you can cause a lot of damage without spending much money. I think you know, nine uh, eleven probably cost two hundred three hundred thousand dollars, and most of that was for hotel rooms and airplane rides. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't for weapons or it's just, it's just a cheap thing. The first attack on the World Trade Center by a guy named Ramzi Youssef uh, in, the, in the early 90s, he, he spent $30,000 building a bomb. That was it. Uh, you know, it's not hard to raise $30,000. So that was in 93, and that was the, that was the, they tried to, 
take it down, but it wasn't quite enough. And then they had sort of vowed to um, to do something bigger. And yeah, it's not it, it's not clear to me at least. It might be to, to some others if they ever actually um, if if that was a motivating factor of nine eleven. Uh, uh-huh. You know what I mean? I don't think I th- it could have been any targets. I mean, in fact, the tar- they left the targeting pretty much up to Mohammed Atta and the guys in the United States with the suggestion that the World Trade Center would be a good one. Uh, but but I don't think it was through him so much as that they were an easy thing to hit. I mean, if you right. see some photos, I mean, there's just these two giant skyscrapers standing up all by themselves on yeah, the lower, yeah. lower part of the island of Manhattan. I mean, they're just, they were, uh, they're just standing there. You know, they're almost inviting an attack. Uh, yeah. So that's and that's that's why they were chosen, but yes, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the man who devised the, the 9/11 plan, has this sort of bizarrely feral quality of just constantly coming up with with ideas for how to commit horrible acts. I mean, walking down the street with with his acolytes, he would reel off five, six, seven, eight different ideas. We could do this. Let's go here and bomb that. Go there, bomb. You know, it's just it was just odd. Uh, and he's uh, still in Guantanamo, right? He is. Yes, he's and, he, he's on. He's there's they've been in pretrial hearings for six years. Oh wow. Oh, okay, so, so there is yeah. a trial looming. Well, looming is maybe not the right word. Okay. Uh, there's a there's a trial in the distance. I used to think that there would probably never be one. Uh, but but I'm, I've begun to think that they might. It, there's an obvious, what's taking so long basically is, uh, is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and a couple of the other several of the other people in the trial. There are five people charged, him and three or four one of one of his nephews and three other guys who helped him. Um, and the, they were all uh, held at black sites for several years, and and tortured extensively. And this is the waterboarding the U- debate and all that from yes. the Bush era and all, yeah. Right. And the U.S. government uh, refuses to allow discussion of torture in the trial. Okay. And for, for reasons that are, I mean, because it's shocking, I guess, but everybody knows what happened now, so it, it makes no sense. So, but until they resolve, I mean, and the defense lawyers down there say, well, we can't really defend these guys unless we know what happened to them. Because they, you know, they made statements admitting to what they've done after they've been tortured for five years. You know, so is that a valid thing? I don't, you know, and we have to describe what happened. And they've had, they've had the same fight, really, almost every time they have a hearing for six years. Uh, so it seems obvious, I mean, to outsiders, that the way to, the way to resolve this impasse is to take the death penalty off the table. Because the lawyers, the defense lawyers, are bound by duty to give these guys the most, their, their lives are at stake, literally. Um, and it, it seems to me the obvious thing would be to trade the death penalty for torture. Okay, you can't talk about torture, but we won't, we won't ask for the death penalty. And then you just go ahead and have a trial with the evidence that, that, that there is. Right. Uh, and I, I think that's that's the way it's going to end up eventually. It, well, you know, what would be the goal of the trial, really? If he's already in Guantanamo, sort of indefinitely, so to speak, would there be would they want life in prison or? Yeah, yeah. yes, they would. But it's yeah, it's an excellent question because even if they're found innocent, they wouldn't be going home. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's it's idiotic. I mean, the whole, the Guantanamo is a mess unto itself. Wasn't Obama supposed to close it? What what happened there? Did that? Not- well, okay. So first. The, the history of it is that the the Bush administration, uh, not long after the invasion of Afghanistan, began, and, and there, if you recall, the the invasion was accomplished with a very small number of troops. It was a very fast, very light, um, and they were soon, and, and, but in, in alliance with several different Afghan factions. And very soon after the invasion, they began accumulating lots of prisoners. They didn't know what to do with them. They, they weren't equipped, actually, to, to build stockades for them. Uh, and they end up with these hundreds of guys. Uh, and, it, and so Guantanamo was supposed to be just a place to put these guys. They didn't know what else to do with them. And also it had the advantage of being outside the United States, according to Bush administration lawyers, 
large parts of the U.S. Constitution would not apply there, uh, giving rise to the torture regime. The torture regime is, I think, uh, simply unconstitutional. It's illegal. But if it happened in a place that wasn't part of the United States, then it's sort of an iffy ground. So that's why it was chosen. Uh, and they eventually had over almost 800 people there, all but 40 of whom are gone, released. Most of them were never tried, never accused of anything. I mean, there were bus drivers and cooks and, uh, you know, some some soldiers, but, but most of these people weren't. They were just guys who got caught up. And a lot of them were sold for bounty to, oh, to the United right. States. The Afghan, rival Afghan factions would scoop these guys up and they'd get maybe 500 bucks a piece for them if they sold them to the United States. Uh, and so a lot of these guys were there under the wrong pretense from the beginning. Some of them were bad guys, but most of them weren't. And so, and eventually most of them have been let go. None have been let go since Obama left. So after Obama came in, yeah, he campaigned on a, a promise to close Guantanamo, which he mm -hmm. saw as extra legal, that it was an illegal thing. Um, and in fact, they, the, these guys were already under charges at Guantanamo, the five guys in this trial. And they dismissed those charges and filed new charges in federal court in New York City. And they were going to come up and try them there. And then the Republican Congress passed a law prohibiting the United States from bringing any of these guys physically into the United States. So they couldn't try them. Uh, and people say, well, Obama didn't keep his promise, but it wasn't, it wasn't Obama's fault. He was sort of he blocked. He was completely blocked. I yeah. mean, they wanted to do something. So eventually they, they, they threw, threw out those charges and recharged them in Guantanamo with this military commission, which is kind of a hybrid court system combining parts of a courts martial and a, and a federal trial uh, with not very many rights for the defendants. Um, so... And, and since Obama left, nobody's been released, obviously, and really nothing has changed. They're still arguing about the same thing they've been arguing about since the charges were first bought. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I saw something, that they, somebody wrote a piece not in the last couple of days, I just saw that, said it's becoming just like a, an elder care facility. You know, some of these people are 70, 80 years old. Yeah. Um, and they, they're having surgeries, they have to bring in medical equipment that isn't there. Uh, it's it's just ridiculous and and, and it's expensive um, right um now in researching the book uh or for the book um the initial one um perfect soldiers what was some of the most glaring or surprising things you learned about the hijackers their mannerisms or their personalities that sort of surprised you or or the deepest insight that you um that you got from it well, I, you know, the title "Perfect Soldiers" is meant to imply that that these guys did what they were told, that they followed orders. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was initially thought that Muhammad Atta was one of the planners one of the plot. Uh, the most surprising thing to me was that he was utterly incapable of that. I mean, he was just not that kind of personality. He was very dutiful. He would he would do what he was told, uh, and that's what he did. And the, and the fact, again, that there was no recruitment. These guys all, all were volunteers to the cause. And, and that, that they, they really didn't have any great animus toward the United States. Uh, College Sheikh Mohammed did, for sure. But the hijackers, most of them didn't. And they're young guys, you know. Um, and, you know, the, the common I idea early on was that they were sort of people locked out of uh, by who were outsiders in their own societies that they were poverty stricken. Almost all these guys were middle class and educated, um, like we said earlier. Uh, right? it, yeah, well educated. Uh, a few of the Saudis had some histories of mental health problems, or otherwise they're just kind of normal guys. Uh, it, it's it's uh, normality in in with within the Arab world is different than it is here. I mean, like Zia Jara, the pilot of the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania, was from Beirut. I don't know if you've ever been to Beirut, but Beirutis all think they live in the capital of the universe. They're like Parisians or New Yorkers. Okay, right? yeah. This is the center of life on the planet. Uh, and it's a very kind of, given the fact that they've been in the middle of a civil war for 25 years, uh, it's a very kind of carefree, big party town, 
uh, people come there from all over the Middle East to party. Uh, and Jara was, was a party boy as a kid. Uh, and not religious, his family. He went to Christian schools. Not because he was Christian, but because those are the best schools in Beirut. Uh, and it was only when he left, went abroad to Germany for college that he became religious. And that happened pretty quickly. Uh, so, how did sorry? How did they get radicalized? Uh, if you could remind me in the in the book, I think it's went over. But they was it different imams that were in Germany that were sort of inspiring them. Yeah. Well, here, here's. You know, Here's a good, Ad is a good example, Muhammad Adda. Uh, his father was a lawyer uh, in Cairo. And, and he came from basically out in the sticks and was kind of ambitious and felt like he was had to fight his way into Kyrene society. Uh, and he, he thought that politics of any kind were a detriment to advancement in society. Um, and at that time in, in Egypt, uh, being overtly religious was associated with a certain kind of radical politics. His family never went to a mosque, ever. Uh, he had three, two daughters and one son. And the, the, the three kids, his father, and his, his father and his mother, never went to the mosque. They were very strict. He, he, like he measured in seconds how long it should take the kids to get home from school. If they weren't home in time, they'd hear about it. I mean, he was just an authoritarian. Uh, I was going to say something bad, but he, yeah, he was just not a pleasant fellow. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Ada goes to college, gets a degree in architecture, uh, described by classmates and teachers as not really a creative architect, but the kind of guy give you a good set of plans. You know, he could, he could draw. <laughs> One of his employers called him a drawing slave, uh, just an automaton. Um, so he goes to, his father wants him to continue his education, get a PhD, and arranges for him to go to Germany, uh, to Hamburg. And he goes there, initially stays with a host family, which is not uncommon, uh, arranged by, I think, probably the Goethe Institute, which is a multinational German cultural promotion thing um he shows up the host family the first question he asks of the host mom is where's the nearest mosque yeah first question um it's you know in, in a way it's probably not surprising you're humberg is uh i lived in seattle for a long time and humberg is a very is almost a clone of seattle or seattle of humberg very it's far north it's gray in the winter time, which lasts forever, it's wet, uh, it's dark, but the people are very stylish. Uh, it's a well-off town. Um, people have a lot of money and um, a very sophisticated place. And you get this kid from Cairo, which is not that, <laughs> which is in, in climate every other way, almost the opposite. Um, and you, you know, one might feel lost. So he wanted um, some familiarity, almost. Yeah, and um, and he and he he started going to the mosque, and there there were uh, there's substantial uh, Muslim population in in Germany, but most of it's Turkish, and the Turks are Shia, uh, and Ada was Sunni. The Arabs mm -hmm. are Sunnis by and large, um, and there was really only one Sunni mosque in Hamburg. And it's called El Kutz Mosque, and it just so happened. I mean, I mean, again, the coincidences are astonishing. That uh, you know, they show up when they need pilots. He goes, starts going to this mosque, and it turns out to be one of the most radical mosques in Europe. And that's it's true. You know, Islam is not organized uh, like like the Catholic Church. It's more like evangelical churches. Every every church is its own entity, kind of. Right, right, I mean, right. they have the same text, the same you know. But the interpretations are sort of vast. Yeah. It's completely up to the imam. Uh, and you can have some of them you couldn't tell from a you know a moderate Lutheran church, you know. Uh, but some of them, you know, the the rhetoric would peel the paint off the walls. Uh, and, and and it so happened that this was El Quds. That's what it was. Um, and so so he starts going there, and there are other Arabs. I mean, he runs into people like him. 
who all find this place that they're in, Hamburg, to be kind of a very odd place. Uh, it was very licentious. Uh, it was famous for its red light district, uh, the Reeperbahn. Uh, and, and in fact, this the mosque was right in the, in the middle of a really bad part of town. I mean, you walk down the street and you see hookers and drug dealers out in plain sight. Um, and you go to the mosque, and what you find is, is is warmth and comfort. It's like a clubhouse. I mean, it isn't just a place of worship; it's a place of of socializing uh, and, and, and a, play, a, a taste of home. I mean, they, they would serve Middle Eastern food. Uh, it's, so in addition to, the, to the, the sermons from the imams and the readings, they, it was this, it had, I, I went in there expecting, not, I don't know what, but it had a very kind of warm feeling. You know I mean? People come in and they hug. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was, you know, uh, very comforting. It just so happens that it, it, it was also very radicalizing for these guys. And and so these guys became radicalized. They became religious. They became extremely devout. And then began asking themselves this question, what should we do? And your obligation is to fight. Now, which of them were were living together? Was that when some of them... Uh, yeah, Ada, Ada and Marwan El-Shehi, who was from the Emirates, um, and Ramsey Ben Sheba, the guy who became the coordinator of the attacks underneath Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, they lived in a, together in an apartment. So they rented. Right? They found a spot to rent, and they just yeah. posted yeah. up there. Yeah. And um, um, I mean, Ada had lived in a student dormitory for seven years uh, with two different roommates, serially, um, and then so that was the first place he lived that wasn't uh, either his family's home or. Uh, a, a student apartment. Uh, no, so Mary so Strauss is a little bleak street, you know, no trees. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Uh, very gray. Um, so how much of it was strictly religious from their standpoint as far as the uh, wanting to go and, and enter the, their journey for the jihad um, and go, uh, go to training and all that? How, was it was there a little bit of the sort of what people call social political concepts mixed in there, or was it strictly to kill infidels or kill Jews? You know, like was it more? Right. Well, there, you know, radical Islam almost by definition is politicized. Right. I mean, right. that's one of its hallmarks. Uh, so yeah, there's it's mainly religious, but the marriage of religion and politics is a fierce thing. Um, you know, if if it's hard. It's hard for a believer to escape in a way. You know, you're, you're if it's just political. If it's if the motivation is the the thing that binds are political, then you can disagree. And in fact, you can leave, right? But if they're also divine, if they're sacred, you're locked in because you can't you can't disobey your God. I mean, that's I'm not a believer, so right. I you know, and I kind of always wished I was. You know, because it seems to give comfort to people or something. But I just couldn't buy it. I was raised in a strict Roman Catholic household, and it just made no sense to me whatsoever. I just thought it was the biggest load of Yeah, I sometimes differentiate uh, what I call uh, sort of active belief versus like a passive belief, um, where active belief is sort of um, uh, like there's a, there's a such thing as a real belief that you just can't get away from. And then there is, um, you know, someone tells you to believe whether it's your church or your parents or something, but you just you just can't help it. You just don't believe. It's just not there. Yeah. And I think, you know, the modern world uh, gives you lo lots of other opportunities. Uh, and um, I grew up in a real small town, and everybody there was Catholic. It was a normal thing. <laughs> so it just didn't take with me. Uh, so, so I find this curious, anyhow, that people have this fervency of belief. But I saw it in my own family. You know, they were like that. They weren't going to go out and kill people on behalf of it. But this is, a, is obviously a step or more removed from that. But but the same sort of fervency. I mean, my father swore that that the obscure sin had caused a miracle to happen uh, that allowed my youngest brother to be born when he should have died at birth. You know, he, he, he prayed to the saint every day for the whole length of my mother's pregnancy. He, he, he went to his grave thinking that that that's what saved the kids' life. Uh, uh, so, 
I'm not, I'm not, uh, it's not foreign to me, the concept of belief, but it's, it, it's this sort of, of dedication of, of deep belief is, it's hard to comprehend for somebody who doesn't experience it. Uh, right. So I, I think the marriage of the politics and the, and the religion is a pretty powerful combination. Right, sort of inescapable uh, in that sense. Can you can you sort of um, enlighten us on um, the is what was the overlap like between the uh, search for Osama and for KSM? Was it all sort of the same operation, or was there? Oh no, far from it. Um, yeah. I you know I'm I'm almost certain that if Bin Laden had been ca- captured or killed in 2000, say in the summer of 2000, the 9/11 would have still happened because KSM was his show. Um, And conversely, if KSM had been captured uh, or killed in the summer of 2000, 9-11 would have never occurred. It just wouldn't have. Uh, And so one of the mistakes that was made was focusing so much attention on bin Laden from the middle 90s on when KSM was at least as bad a guy maybe worse, and the one who had done, already done real damage. Uh, and the, the, the hunt for Bin Laden, uh, while not overwhelming, was substantially greater resource intensive than the one for KSM. Basically, just one guy looked for KSM, two guys, for most of 10 years. Uh, he was, uh, a, you know, he was being investigated by the United States from 1995 on. Uh, for a plot that had fallen apart in Manila, in the Philippines, which was really just a basic, uh, the earliest version of the 9-11 plot. He was going to smuggle bombs on the airplanes and let, have the bombs all set to be timed, timed to all go off at the same time. And they were going to have bombs on 10 or 12 different airplanes that would all blow up over the Pacific Ocean, full of Americans. Uh, if you do the math on that, that would be like four or 5,000 people. These are all 747s, the biggest big aircraft. Uh, the plot was discovered and foiled, and everybody involved in it, except for KSM, was eventually caught. Uh, and this one FBI agent from New York chased this guy all over the globe. Uh, and, and he went all over the globe. KSM was, I mean, he went to, to uh, Brazil to buy frozen chicken parts, you know, uh, and, to, and he imported palm oil from uh, Malaysia. To, to the Middle East, uh, it's just this kind of frantic, always in motion quality to it. And he, he did everything in person. He didn't like to do phone call. They had those oh, kind of went, throwaway phones sometimes, but he, no emails or when it was emails, it was just kind of broken. Yeah, no, he broken. did most of it in person. Um, he he and he well, he was building this network uh, while he was doing whatever of these these legitimate businesses that he was involved in. He was always always plotting something on the side and been recruiting people to, to work with him on it. Um, and, and so the, he was, they chased him all over the place and never caught him. He came close several times. Uh, but the fact that, you know, he had basically one guy looking for him, it's just, it's criminal. So the resources were sort of mixed up, like they should have been looking for. Right. They should have been looking for him. I mean, yeah. he had already, he'd had an active plot that would have so, killed thousands. Remind me again, whose idea was it when 9-11 happened? Uh, did the CIA and FBI, were they both sort of like, okay, let's look at bin Laden? Did they, because he was on the radar. Yeah, but in fact, uh, they had tried to kill him. I mean, uh, Clinton had sent cruise missiles after him in, what, 90, what year was that? I can't remember, or whenever, uh, 98, I guess. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Um so he, he had been a, a target of the CIA forever and, uh, and was indicted in the United States in the mid-90s. Um, and there was a, an active FBI. The way, the way in the United States, the way terrorism responsibilities are divided is anything that happens domestically or that will become a crime in the United States, killing American citizens or wherever, that's the FBI's property. I mean, they... they, they, they they're, they're a law enforcement agency. What they try to do is arrest guys and put them on trial. So they're, they're building cases. That's what yeah, they do. Yeah. They collect the evidence and build cases. 
And the CIA is, has responsibility for everything abroad, uh, all terrorism activities abroad. Uh, so bin Laden was theirs, more or less. Uh, and KSM was the FBI's. And the, the, the CIA wouldn't give much help on the hunt for KSM at all, ever. Uh, but it's not, it's because they didn't think it was important. I mean, it's, I always, you know, I thought about it. You had an FBI agent and a CIA agent standing, you know, uh, back to back, you know, looking at the, you know, they're at the scene of a crime. They would see utterly different things. Right. 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 There's a scene in, in the hunt for KSM where they had, uh, Americans and Pakistanis had captured a guy they thought was a key Al Qaeda guy. He turned out not to be. But they, at the time, he was thought to be the third ranking member of Al Qaeda. Um, and in, the, in, in being captured, he got shot and was, it seemed, possibly mortally wounded. And so they were trying to keep him alive. They were in this little hospital out in the middle of uh, the Punjab. And uh, the guys passed out. They were just trying to keep him breathing. Uh, and the FBI had collected all the evidence from the, the arrest site, including his phone. And they, they put it in a sealed uh, uh, evidence envelope, bag it and tag it, they call it. Uh, and all of that stuff would then be sent back to Washington and be used in a trial at some point. So they were always about preserving evidence. So this, the, so that they had his phone, it was bagged and tagged. And while they're trying to keep the guy alive, his phone rings. You know, this guy they think is the big Al Qaeda guy, his phone is ringing. Who's on the other end? Yeah. The yeah. FBI guys would not let them open up the bag. Right, because they wanted it. Yeah. It's a chain of evidence, right? You can't. <laughs> so, you know, whereas the CIA person would think, are you crazy? We need to know I, who's calling, yes. Yeah. Um, so the, the FBI is about prosecuting crimes. The CIA is, against, is about preventing activities in the world or influencing activities in the future. So one's backward looking and one's forward looking. Uh, it's just the fact that the, the, the sad fact that the forward-looking part of that partnership, the CIA, looked forward and didn't see KSM. They didn't realize KSM was the, the driver behind the events until a year later, almost. Right. Now, what is the current state of um, Al Qaeda? And and is, it, I mean, of course, ISIS is the, um, you know, the headline these days, and and we have the whole debate uh, uh, with whether ISIS is quote unquote defeated. Um, and then, um, but there's, you know, one journalist that I love to follow on the ISIS topic is Rukmini Kalamaki. You're familiar? Yeah. 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 She's great. Um, if people don't know who she is, you can, she had that Caliphate podcast and everything. Sure. Um, what are other, some other uh, topics like that that you're focused on at, at all? Are you still looking in the, in the terrorism world? Do you follow these journalists? Uh, I, I do it more as habit than toward any use. I'm not going to probably write any more books about sure, it. Sure, sure. Um, it was, it really did take eight years out of my life. And yeah. uh, to the point where I dreamed about it every night. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a depressing subject. There, there are no, happy, there are no happy days on the terrorism beat. No, no. Uh, and it's an un, unending subject. I mean, it just keeps happening, right? Uh, yeah. Just yeah. won't go away. In fact, it seems more prevalent now than ever. Um, so I don't, I just, I pay attention to it, but, but not, I mean, I've tried to, I mean, my, my, my next book after KSM was a book about baseball. You know, you can't, you can't get further away. Uh, and I'm, I'm researching a book now on Los Angeles. So I don't think I'm going to be doing any more terrorism writing. It was just too depressing and it takes too much out of you. And it's hard. It's oh, I could hard. imagine. Yeah. It's just too hard. Um, uh, what were what were some of the most dangerous uh, or toughest uh, moments in your uh, travels when you're researching for the? Oh, I movie? had some. We don't talk about around the family, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, they'll never see this. So now, but I was, you know, transported across national borders in trunks of cars uh, more than once. Uh, shot at a couple times. Uh, was threatened many more times. Uh, and you just use the cash to kind of, like you said earlier, like translation and whatnot, but you would, I'm guessing, pay people to get you in certain places. and Yeah, you'd hire drivers and cars, and trucks, and, and security people. Were you scared, or did you just treat it as part of the job? I, You know, I, I was scared afterward, but I, at the time, I just 
didn't appreciate the danger. The danger, the danger. I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, uh, well, a kind way to say I was a focus, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm probably single-minded in a, in a dangerous way. And, and I just saw that I had to, I had to do this. I mean, I, it was not a duty, but I, for myself, I had to, I had to get the story, right? Uh, that's that's about as bad a excuse as you can have for getting killed, <laughs> right? Um, but it's not uncommon with journalists uh, that they 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 refuse to stop, um, and and it's probably I used to think that was a, that was an an honorable characteristic. Now I think it's just vanity. Uh, I think I did it because I was vain. Uh, there's a there's a novel called Paper Boys by Pete Dexter, and the protagonist is an investigative reporter. Early in the book, Dexter describes investigative reporters. He says they're the ones who don't really care about the story they're telling you. They care that they're the ones doing this doing the telling. <laughs> right, I can see that. Uh, yeah, and I think I more, more than fell victim to, to that. Well, either way, the outcome was obviously a very important uh, information and. Um... Um, so if people want to get that book, what's the best place? Amazon, anywhere yeah, online? Yeah, anywhere online. Uh, I'm a big fan of Powell's books in Portland, Portland, Oregon. It's one of the biggest bookstores in the world. So if they want to go physically get a, get a physical copy and yeah. there are Powell's, you can order online from Powell's too, but yeah, Amazon is there. They, they have all the books. And, uh, where, where can they, when can we expect uh, your next book? Uh, we know it's not, uh, on terrorism, but, uh, if people well, are into baseball or whatever. <laughs> they still books out. Oh, that uh, one's out. Okay. Buy that. It's called Off Speed. Um, and the, there's another book on the biochemistry of memory, <laughs> which is kind of a scientific adventure story, uh, is the way I describe it. They're, they're all available wherever fine books are sold. And the next book probably won't be out for a couple of years. Okay. And so where can people find you online? Do you have a website or your, your Twitter is Terry I, McDermott? I have, I have a, yeah, I have a website, but it's just an archive. I mean, I, I don't uh, update it. I just I use it as a promotional device for the books, uh, sure, sure. and it has a lot of the stuff I've done over years on it. Just as a place to have it all. Um, uh, yeah, I tweet, but again, not not that much. I'm at Terry McDermott. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Either way, very cool. Now, yeah. we just wanted to thank you again for your time, and uh, you really enjoyed the book, uh, both books, and I'm gonna probably check out your new one too so thanks again for your time terry and uh yeah. we'll, we'll talk to you later okay take care man okay thanks. Conversation. yeah so long